Good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome to WOW, our worship on Wednesday. We are so very grateful that you have joined us on today. We have a wonderful word coming from one of our associate ministers, and we just know that you're going to be richly blessed. Join us now as we go to the Lord in prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we honor you, and we magnify your name. We lift you up in this place. We pray now that you will open up the windows of heaven and rain down your blessings and favor upon us. Move us from where we are to where you've called us to be, and we'll be careful to give your name the praise, the honor, and the glory. It's in the matchless and wonderful name of Jesus. Jesus Christ, that we pray, every heart set together, amen, amen, and amen. pleasure to be in the house of the Lord once again. Amen. How grateful we are to be here today. And how awesome was that song? It's our God. It's our God who does everything for us. He is our source and our resource. He's the one who sustains us. It's our God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Giving honor to God, to our pastor, the Reverend Dr. 
Rayvon Turner Sr., to our Pastor Emeritus, the Reverend Dr. Marvin A. Jennings Sr., to all of you who are watching, us, watching me in cyberspace or here in the sanctuary, God bless you and may continue to bless you. I take it as an honor to be here this evening to share this word from God with you. I would like to turn your attention to the book of Exodus. And I will be reading Exodus 3, 14, and 15. And in your spare time, when you get a moment, read verses 1 through 15. And you'll see the point, the illustration that I'm preparing to give to you this evening. And then you can take it in your context a little better. But for time's sake, I'm going to read just th uh, verses 14 and 15. And it reads like this. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and say unto them, The God of your fathers have sent me unto you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am that sent me unto you. And God said moreover to Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you right now for waking us up this morning and allowing us to go about our way. Father, we thank you for watching over us last night. But Father, we know that it is you who are our sustainer. Father, it's in you, Lord God, that we live and we move and we have our very being. Lord God, I pray this night, Lord God, that you will continue to keep your divine hand upon your people, that you'll watch over us, that you'll provide our every needs according to your riches and glory, Lord God. Father, I pray, Lord God, that the words that I from my mouth and the meditation from my heart will be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. I want to talk to you this evening from the theme, do you know him? Do you know him? That's why I say it was so appropriate for the song that he just played about our God. So do, do you know him? Do we really know him? But before we delve into this text for this evening, I would like to take a moment to just tell you a little story, a story about myself. When I was a child, attending my first day of kindergarten, it was one of the most exciting days of my young life. And I would think it would be part of the most exciting days of, one of most of your lives. It's the first time that we actually have an opportunity to, to believe or have the concept that we have some freedom. Our parents aren't looking over our shoulders all the time. They're not tugging and pulling at us, telling us what to do. We have a little bit of freedom. Amen? Until, it was the exciting day of my life until, the teacher began to take attendance. She had completed taking attendance then she promptly asked if there was anyone's name that she didn't call. I immediately raised my hand. You know, I'm waving my hand. Hey, hey, hey. Then she promptly asked me, she immediately, she asked me was, she was very courteous about it, excuse me. And she asked me what my name was. I told her my name was Dwayne Kelly. She checked her attendance sheet. She looked up and down it, but she didn't see 
my name. And she said, I'm sorry, I don't have a Dwayne Kelly listed for my classroom. But I do have an Irwin Kelly. I emphatically denied knowing this person because my name is Dwayne Kelly. She asked me a couple of questions about my parents, which I was familiar with because we were taught these things about where our parents were, our name, their names, our phone number, our address, in the event that something unforeseen ever happened to us. Needless to say, I don't recall anything else that happened during class. My mind is shut down, and the only thing circling around in my head was getting home and questioning my parents about this Irwin person. As soon as the bell rang, and we were dismissed from class, I ran home to get some answers to the questions that had occupied my entire day. Hmm. My parents, they confirmed that Irwin Dwayne Kelly was my legal or government name, but they decided to call me by my middle name, Dwayne, until this very day. I still don't know the reasoning behind it. I say this to illustrate a very important fact. I knew what my name was, but I didn't know what my legal or government name was, the name that will follow me all my entire life. There are a number of us today who only knew someone by the name by which they were introduced to us by. But if we were ever questioned about that person by their legal or government name, at least half of us, half of us, would have no idea who we were being questioned about. Amen? Now, there is a similar, this is similar to what is happening in our text today. Israel only knew their God as the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So consequently, they were unaware or had no knowledge of God as the great I am. So now, allow me to just give you the backdrop to this story here. When Moses asked God, who should I tell them sent me? God answered, tell them I am. Now, we must understand that for nearly 400 years, 400 years now, the children of Israel had not heard from their God. They thought their God was dead, AWOL, or maybe even on vacation. Not long, not long after Abraham had been introduced to God, his descendants, the Hebrew people, found themselves in slavery in a foreign land. Now, he just heard from God, but now they're slaves. A promise had been made, a promise that they will be a mighty nation and possess the land of Canaan. But the reality of it all was that they were slaves in the land of Egypt. Now, the million dollar question was, how could this happen or how could this be? God had assured them that he would be their God and that he would never, never leave them. Now, such Larry's promises seem like a cruel joke, a harsh joke, when you're shackled in chains and God hasn't been heard from in centuries. Can I get an amen? Perhaps they thought, God must be a myth. Or maybe the story of Abraham was a legend. In their infinite minds, in their finite minds, they began to think, obviously, we must have misunderstood those promises 
if they were ever promises. Moses himself may have wrestled with such doubt. While living in exile in Midian, Moses encountered a burning bush. And in that experience, he met God firsthand. God told Moses to go back to Egypt and lead his people to freedom. When Moses asked, who should I tell them sent me? God answered, I am. The meaning of I am is powerful, very powerful, even when translated into English. I am says, and it means that I exist. But as a name, it also suggests timelessness, self-sufficiently, see, and changeless. The Israelites now, during the time of Moses, may not have been familiar with I am, but I am still knew all about them. Hallelujah. He knew that they would struggle to believe in a God who couldn't be seen. A God who transcends time. He knew that they would struggle to believe that God was there. God knew that they would be fickle and faithless and that they would need constant and consistent rescuing from the consequences of their own foolish choices. And yet still, Yet still, he set his affections on them. We are constantly and consistently asking God questions. Are you able to see me? Are you wanting to know me? Are you going to help me? Are you willing to forgive me? And to all these questions, God's answer is, I am. Now, let's explore each of these commonly asked questions and determine if we really know God. Do you know him for yourself? Our first commonly asked question is, does God see me? Certainly God sees us. You may not know him by the name as I am, but maybe, just maybe, you know him as El Roy. El Roy is the God who sees us. When we're up to no good, we prefer to be unnoticed. Amen? But who I mean, who? Who wants to be overlooked when life is unraveling in front of their faces? Implicit in the name of Elroy is God's overriding compassion for us. In Genesis 16 and 13, when Hagar had no idea where to go or what to do next, she was reminded that God is real, that he sees her needs, and he sees the needs of his creatures, and that he draws near to help us. God just doesn't glance our way long and hard. He studies the difficulties we face, and then, and only then, does God act. Do you feel like you're alone? That nobody really sees you, much less understands what's going on in your life? The troubles you are facing? Do you feel like you're alone? No, never feel like you're alone, because God is always there. Even in your darkest times, trust that El Roy, the God that sees you, is there. He sees. 
He sees you. He looks intently. He notices. He studies everything and misses nothing. Otherwise, others may overlook you or forget you, my brothers and sisters. But God will never leave you and God will never overlook you. He will always see what's going on in our lives. And because he sees us, he knows what we need and gladly, he gladly provides the comfort we need and that need that we're looking for. My Lord, maybe you don't know him as I am, but maybe you know him as El Roy, the God that sees you. Amen? Our second most commonly asked question is, does God want to know me? Without fear of contradiction, their answer is yes. Of course, God wants to know us. He created us in his image. My Lord, why wouldn't he want to know us? I mean, if he created us in his image, we are part of him. He already knows us. So maybe you might not know him as the great I am or Elroy, but perhaps you know him as El Chi. El Chi. El Chi means the God of our lives. One of the awesome teachings of the Christian faith is that we are not defined by what we do. Our identity is rooted in our everlasting God who made us. Not in the things that we make, our careers, our families, our finances, whatever it may be. It is God who defines us. As the one who defines us, God is the one who designed us as well. Before and after we are anything else, we are redeemed people who are beloved creatures of God, made by him, for him. We were built for his glory. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm talking about life, real life, abundant life, eternal life comes only from God. He is our life. Amen. Psalms 30, 73 and 26 says, my flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God gives us value and purpose, my brothers and sisters. Our worth and our identity comes from him, not from anything we do or not from anything we don't do. God created us to know, to love, to serve, and to be satisfied in him. Amen? Does he want to know us? God knew us before the foundations of the world. God tells, God names us and tells us who we are. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that God knew you before the foundations of the world? Aren't you glad that he counted you in the number before end time? God knows us. He doesn't want to know us. He already knows us. He knew us in the beginning of time. Our third most commonly asked question is, does God want to help me? Now, if God sees us, if God knows us intimately, how can we not fathom that he doesn't want to help us? Perhaps you know him as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord God who heals. Now, 
when we think of healings in the Bible, we tend to think of all those jaw-dropping physical restorations, lepers being made whole, the blind having their sight restored, the lame suddenly jumping and leaping through the air. Now, without a doubt, these are all marvelous and miraculous demonstrations of God's power. But yet, his power far transcends the physical realm. We are complex beings, my brothers and sisters. And our brokenness due to sin is complex as well. Can I get an amen? Sometimes our deepest hurts can't be seen on an x-ray or be resolved through a blood test. If we wallowed in guilt and shame, felt the heartbreak of a broken relationship, agonized over a wayward family member, felt grief over the loss of a loved one, or been disappointed by an unfulfilled dream, we know that spiritual, emotional, and relational hurt can be more painful than the physical maladies. But here is the good news. The good news is that God is able to heal more than just the physical. I mean much, much more. In fact, God will help us meet our greatest need, spiritual healing. Glory to God. Psalms 3, 1 and 3 says, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many of them that say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah. But thou, O Lord, art shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. Lord, have mercy. When Jesus was on earth, he healed many people. But none of those healings were an ever an end within itself. Each compassionate healing was a sign of things to come. The physical healings pointed people towards the kingdom of God that was coming. They pointed people towards a new heaven and a restored earth. They pointed people towards a place where there will be no more pain, there will be no more suffering, in a place where there will be no more pain. You can find that in Revelation 21, 4. Today, my brothers and sisters, when God heals a broken bone, a broken heart, or a broken relationship, God is giving us a foretaste or a small glimpse of what is to come. God is Jehovah Rapha. He is our healer. He will help us through our most troubling times with our greatest need. Spiritual healing. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Our God is an awesome God. And as we come to our fourth and final commonly asked question, will God forgive me? Now, we've discovered that I am can be known by a multitude of names. Elroy, the God that sees us. El Chi, the God of our lives, the God that knows us. And Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, the God that helps us. Does God want to forgive us? I am confident in saying, yes, God does want to forgive us. Do you know what his name is? His name is Yahweh. Or better known 
is God. Just simply that, God. Our God is a forgiving God. Thank God. From the beginning of the scriptures to the end of the scriptures, God is praised as a God of pardon. In Exodus 34 and 7, Moses exclaims that the God of Israel keeps loving kindness for thousands and forgives iniquity, transgressions, and sin. In Colossians 2 and 13, Paul echoes the same thing. He says, God has forgiven us all our transgressions. But now, there are many misunderstandings of God's forgiveness in the church today. And most of these errors tend to cheapen our estimation of the glory of God's forgiveness. We must always be cognizant of the fact that God's forgiveness is central to the gospel message and based on the finished work of Christ. The gospel preached by the apostles consistently stresses the forgiveness of sin as one of the chief benefits of Christ's work. It is important and imperative that we realize that forgiveness is not cheap. Forgiveness is always expensive. And God's forgiveness is the most expensive of all. And you may ask, you may say, preacher, why is that? It cost God the life of his only begotten son the precious son that he loved. Colossians 1 and 13 through 14 states, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. My God. The fact is, it's freely offered to us, but we should never be allowed to obscure the fact that the gospel message is not that God forgives, but that God forgives at the price of his son. We don't deserve it, and God certainly doesn't owe it to us. God has not simply repealed our penalty because of Christ's work, God has assessed our penalty to Christ. It's a debt paid, not merely set aside. This is why the Lord can say in Isaiah 45 and 25, I will not remember your sins. Grace Emmanuel, my question for you today is, do you know him? Maybe you don't know him as the great I am. Maybe you don't know him as Elroy, the God that sees us. Maybe you don't know him as El Shachai, the God that knows us. Maybe you don't know him as Jehovah Rapha, the God that helps us. Maybe you don't know him as, maybe you know him as Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. Perhaps you may know him as El Elyon, the supreme God. Perhaps you may know him as El Shaddai, God Almighty. Perhaps you know him as El Elyon, the most high God. Or maybe you might even know him as El Elyon, the eternal God. But it doesn't matter what name you associate with him. As the scriptures declared in our text today, I am that I am is this memorial unto all generations. Now, my brothers and sisters, if you don't know him, by any of the numerous names that I've mentioned today, there is a way to get to know him. You must begin by accepting his son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior. Get on the path. Get to have a personal relationship with God. And your life will be so much richer, so much more joyful, and so much more exciting.
God bless you and thank you.